Somebody tell me what a fetter is? A what? A chain? Okay. I didn't know. Like I'm chained to her. She blinds me, buddy. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think this little group of people has any idea how blessed you are in a lot of ways. But one way in particular struck me this morning. Uh, I've, I've been teaching and preaching and sharing lessons for probably 50 years now. Getting a lesson together is not a big deal. Okay, I'm sure it's not for Stan, Everett, uh, Pete, Marty. Uh, I've just done it so many times that uh, getting a lesson together is not a big deal. But there's a lot of people here, a lot of men, those men, George, Jim, who, who do a, a fantastic job sharing the message. And, and I don't think you realize that, that in most churches, there might be one or maybe two people who can effectively share the word. Not because they're bad people, they just haven't been blessed with that uh, ability or that gift. Uh, it, this place is immensely blessed. And when I say it's not a big deal to get a lesson together, I'm, I'm not saying that arrogantly or pridefully. But the real issue, and I feel this very much this morning, is I, and I know Stan's felt it, other, the other guys have felt it. I just pray that God has the, will use me to get the message across powerfully. Amen. Okay? That's not about me. That's not about Stan. That's not about Pete. Okay? There are some people who are gifted with charisma that they can really latch on to an audience and hang on to them, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to really, when the bread of life is broken, to really communicate it in a way that it grabs people's heart and really gets the message to them. And, and, and boy, that's my prayer this morning. We're studying the, the 23rd Psalm, and we're down to verse 3. And there's four words we're going to look at. And, and, and you say, well, well, man, that can't be very complicated, Mike. And it's not. Okay. But boy, it is such a powerful four words. If we could begin to grasp it, just begin to grasp it, it would change our lives, and it would change the lives that we touch around us. He says about the shepherd, he restores my soul. Wow. Say that with me. He restores my soul. One more time. He restores my soul. Can you begin to grasp that? Can you begin to grasp that? The Hebrew word for restore is, I think it's pronounced shub. And it means to return to the starting point to set again. To return to the starting point to set again. That's what the shepherd does for you and me. You see, when we're born into this world, we are sinless and perfect created in God's image. But we, as Adam and Eve did, we mess that up really quick. And God said, I, I, don't, I don't want 
my creation. I want my creation to be with me. So he said, I need to figure out a way to set again their soul to the place that it was when they came into this world. And thus the plan of salvation. Thus Jesus Christ coming to earth and living a perfect life and being mistreated and, and cursed and hung on a cross after being beaten nearly to death. So my sorry soul could be restored. Wow. It, if I thought that in the last three or four minutes that you got that, I'd stop and we'd go home. Because that thought understood will transform lives. Your life and other people's lives. Now, I'm going to keep going. That's not because I, don't, I think you're dumb and didn't get it. Okay, okay. But I, I, I did some work to get ready, and I don't want to waste that, okay? okay. So if, if you have your Bibles and you would like, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to, we're going to kind of uh, go through a little story here. We're going to hit some of it and skip some of it. But before we go to that story, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, You were once darkness. Okay. Now you are light. That's restoring the soul. Before we became a child of God, before we obeyed, the gospel of Jesus Christ that God chose so graciously to share with us. We were in darkness. Now we're light. Now we're light. That's restoring the soul. And I, I want you to walk out of here this morning uh, excited to the max because you've learned about the breath of God being in you and because you know that your soul is restored. In, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a story that takes place between Elisha and a, a woman from Shuman. And we're going to read a little bit of it starting in verse 8. One day Elisha went to Shunem. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to come and stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She must have fixed pretty good food. Okay. Man, I, I, can, is there any way we can go by Schumann this, to, this week? Okay. That, that lady's a good cook. I want to stop and get something to eat. She said to her husband... I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Boy, there's a lesson. Okay, Not the one for today, but there's a lesson. Okay, Just being in Elisha's presence, she said, man, there's a holy man of God. So let's make a small room on the roof and put in a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. I imagine he was thrilled about that. Great cook, place to sleep, place to stay. One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and he lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shumanite. So he called her and she stood before him and Elisha said to him, Tell her you have gone to all this trouble for us, the room to stay in. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? Elisha was so grateful and thankful, he said, Hey, is there anything we can do to return your gen generosity? 
Obviously, Elisha had a relationship with the king and the commander of the army. You know, the, I guess that'd be the secretary of defense. I, I, boy, I almost said something. I mean, I didn't say it. I'm trying to transform. Okay. But he said, you know, we could get something done. She replied, I have a home among my own people. <laughs> There's a nice statement. She said, I, I don't need anything. I've got a home. I'm with my kin. I'm good. I don't need you to do anything for me. What can be done for her, Elisha asked. He was just so excited to give her something in return. Gehazi said, well, she has no son. And her husband's an old codger. Okay. She's not about to have a son married to him. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. Wow. No, my Lord, she objected. Don't, don't mislead your servant, O oh man of God. She said, come on. Have you seen the fellow that I'm married to? I, I'm not having a son, and I, and I don't think I'm interested in having an affair. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year about that same time she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers, and he said, My head, my head! His father told a servant, Carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat her on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. What do you think she was expecting? Yeah, I mean, if he could, if he could take my old codger of a husband and cause me to be pregnant and have a baby, surely, if I can get him back here, he can fix this situation. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants. Da, da, da. Why, why go to him today, he said. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. I don't know if that was the early stages of astronomy or what that was. It's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on and don't slow down for me unless I tell you. In other words, I, I'm sitting on the donkey. You keep us moving. Even if it bounces me around, and even if it's difficult, if I can't take any more, I'll let you know, and we'll take a break. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, here comes the Shumanite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your kid okay? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. She, she had come and, and bowed down and grabbed the feet of Elisha, begging for some help with this. Elisha said to Gehazi, oh, verse 26, 28, I forgot it. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? He's saying, why'd you do this to me, Elisha? I didn't ask you to give me a son. You give me a son, and then you take him away. She was distressed. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand, and run. If you meet anyone, don't stop and greet them. If anyone greets you, do not answer. That's where I get my approach to life. <laughs> See, it's biblical. <laughs> Let my staff, lay my staff on the boy's face. 
But the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I'm not leaving without you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to Mount to meet Elisha and told him, The boy is not awakened. I did what you told me to do, but it hasn't worked. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. I imagine he and God were having a chat. And then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. He did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in and fell at his feet, bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Now we're going to skip over to chapter 8. And if you really want to get the impact of what we're going to read in chapter 8, you need to go home this afternoon and read chapter 5, 6, and 7. Okay. Now Elisha had said to the woman whose son, this is the Shunammite, he had restored to life. Restored is the same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 23, 3, that says, He restore my soul. Same Hebrew word. Set to the starting point. Set again. And go ahead and read the rest of, of, of chapter 8. Here's the point. There is a, an illustration of what restoring when God says the Lord is my shepherd he restores my soul it's just the same as as giving life again to a dead body he gives life again to your soul and to my soul now man if, if, if you can't get excited about that I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry. I was, uh, I, I was uh, at home last night, and, and I, was, I was watching a couple things uh, on my phone. And uh, uh, Stan, you, you've, probably, you've probably heard this. If you, have, if you guys haven't heard this, go home and, and, and find it and listen to it. Okay. Uh, have any of you ever heard the Celtic women sing? They're amazing. They were amazing. And I happened on one, and they were singing, You Raised Me Up. And, and sitting there in, in, in my bedroom, I, I got tears in my eyes. It was so emotionally moving to know, to know that God has taken Mike, the sorry thing that he is, the weak thing that he is, and he has raised me up. I, I can't wrap my head around that. I can't wrap my head around that. We're almost done. How should I respond to that? I ought to respond to that. <laughs> Other than just saying thanks. Paul. Paul understood grace maybe better than anybody 
at, at the point that he was writing the word. He understood grace. He knew what he was and what he had become because of God's grace. He says in Romans chapter 1 this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, Jesus Christ our Lord, and for his name's sake... We have received grace, wow, and apostleship. Hmm. How do I respond? By being an apostle, by being a messenger. He says, an apostleship to call people from among the Gentiles to the obedience that comes through faith. That, that's my response. When I say, Shepherd, thank you for raising me up. What can I do? Just share the message. Just share the message. First, First Corinthians 15. For I am the least of the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. This is Paul talking again. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. What am I? I'm a raised up soul. I was in darkness, now I'm in light. I'm a raised up soul. You're a raised up soul. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me, with me, mm -hmm. was not without effect. Mm. His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. So I could earn my way to heaven. Nah. I worked harder than any of the other apostles because of the greatness, the graciousness I felt because he raised me up. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Boy, the Holy Spirit is powerful, isn't it? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is powerful. God has raised you up. He has raised me up. Don't let it be without effect. Don't let it be without effect. Be determined that, that, that I'm not, you know... I'm, I'm grateful that you're here, and it's great that we go to church. But that's not what it's about. God restored my soul. I won't let it be without effect. I'll go to church. That's not what it's about. Let the grace of God have an effect in your life. Remember, think about where you were when you were without Christ and where you are now. And, and, and if, you can't, if you can't get emotional about that, boy, spend some time on your knees and let the grace of God have an effect on you and, and, and this body of people. Amen. Dear God, thank you. Those are such shallow words, uh, but we mean them from our heart.
Thank you for restoring our soul. Thank you for making, moving us out of darkness and into light. God, help us to be committed and determined that that great and grand sacrifice will not be without effect in our lives. That we will be determined to be effective and transform our lives because the, the breath of God is within us and there's nothing that we can't do without, with, without there's nothing that we can't do with the breath of God in us and thank you for that we pray that in Jesus name Amen, Amen. thanks for your attention God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven above